If I don't climb, life seems empty. I need climbing now, part of my life. I need that stimulus, that excitement, and the natural beauty of the mountain. I suppose the problem is in the end. It's addictive. And for some people, it's a fatal addiction. Climbers of every nationality, K2 has always been the mountain of mountains, the ultimate Himalayan challenge. But it's never had a British ascent. Chris Bonington attempted it in 1978, and two other expeditions were also unsuccessful. In 1986, Alan Rouse led the British Fuller's K2 expedition to K2 to take up the challenge. My role on the expedition was climbing cameraman, and it was to be the challenge of a lifetime. So the events of 1986 have gone down in the annals of mountaineering history. K2, the second highest mountain in the world, is situated on the borders of Pakistan and China and is some 800 miles to the west of Everest. It's in the Karakoram Range, which is a vast range of mountains running north of the true crest of the Himalayas. All expeditions going to K2 start from Royal Pindi, which is an uncompromising introduction to the east, with few attractions for the tourists. Several days are spent in the bazaars, buying the basic foodstuffs for the next two or three months. In our case, this involves some two and a half tons of gear and food for ourselves and our quarters. There were 11 of us all together, eight lead climbers, a doctor and a base camp manager. The team was led by Alan Rouse, one of Britain's best known younger mountaineers, and included some of the most experienced climbers around, such as Brian Hall, John Porter, the Burgess twins, Dave Wilkinson, John Barry, and myself as climbing cameraman. 1986 was a strange year because the Pakistani authorities had given permission for nine separate expeditions to go on K2 at the same time, a fact that we became gradually aware of as superstars from the mountaineering world began to assemble in Rolf Indy. Amongst the well-known names arriving were the Austrian climber Kurt Deenberger and Julie Tullis. They would be on their third attempt on the mountain. Everest is great and imposing, but K2 is, is more than that. K2... Uh, has also a certain a certain trend to go towards the sky. It's a perfect pyramid from every side where you where you see it. I don't know, it, it's like a very big crystal and its shape has fascinated me from the first moment. And it rises up so steeply from all the mountains that are around it too. It's not overshadowed by anything anything else large being so close to it. It does have something that draws you back. I d I don't know Many people have tried it. It's not for lack of trying. It, mm. it's, it doesn't uh, open its arms to everybody. From Royal Pindi, half the expedition travelled up the Great Karakoram Highway with the bulk of the expedition gear. The two and a half tons is far too heavy to take on the internal flight. Some of us were lucky enough to get the plane, one of the most spectacular and dangerous flights in the world, as Al Burgess explains. The flight to Skardu was really exciting because it took us past Dangapaba, another mountain giant that I'd climbed on a few years before. And it was all inspiring to look down on the face we'd climbed before. And we were all crouched in the window, looking towards the east, hoping to get a glimpse of K2. And way over in the distance, we could see a slight peak, and everybody knew instantly it was K2. 
the plane banked towards the east and started to come down towards a small green patch, almost like a jewel set in the dust of the Indus Valley, and we came down to land in Skardu. Before you start the walk-in proper, there's the chaotic but necessary ritual of selecting some 200 porters to get us on the 100-mile journey to base camp. Choosing them is a bit of a nightmare, and you try and pick the people who've got the best shoes and have got a certain amount of personality about them, because some of them can be very inexperienced, and they're going to be travelling in fairly harsh and demanding territory. They're fine until they get onto the Baltoro Glacier, and the crucial part of the walking is always the last four or five days over the ice, up to K2 base camp. The porters carry about 50 pounds of our gear, plus some of their own, and they're paid by Pakistani standards quite well. It works out at about five pounds a day. This year we started at the end of April. It was still early spring, and I was surprised, having been to the Karakoram before, to find how low the rivers were. Sometimes they can be quite hard and very dangerous to cross, but this year we were able to wade or ford, or even on precarious bridges, cross the rivers with no great difficulty, though most of us were still very wary of them. But the porters generally take it all in their stride. Concordia is named after the Place de la Concorde in Paris and is the point where three major glaciers meet. It's surrounded by the great high peaks of the Karakoram, the Gashabrams, Broad Peak, Chogaliza. And as you look around at this fantastic and almost legendary panorama, your eyes inevitably drawn to the head of the upper Baltoro Valley, where this monstrous great triangular wedge of K2, still over 12 miles away, just completely dominates the horizon. Concordia, we were able to identify some of the features of K2 that to the mountaineer have become almost household names. The Abruzzi Ridge, the Shoulder, House's Chimney. Chris Bonington, who attempted K2 in 1978, describes the mountain's dramatic history. It wasn't until 1938 that the first really serious mountaineering expedition made an attempt. Their achievement in 1938 was remarkable, not only in getting very high up on the mountain, but also, this was the first really good bit of filming that had ever been made in the mountaineering expedition. The 1938 expedition was led by a young American medical student, Charlie Houston. Houston's party made its way laboriously by a pony train from Srinagar in Kashmir to the remote mountain province of Baltistan. Houston employed only 70 Balti porters. In addition to the six high-altitude Sherpas, he was freely able to bring across pre-partition India. Every expedition attempting to reach the heart of the Karakoram must first cross the Braulu River, in those days by precarious birch twig bridges. These bridges have only just been replaced, and I still have vivid memories of making terrified swinging progress over the raging torrents. This film, shot in 1938, is believed to be the earliest colour film taken of a Himalayan expedition. Houston made the decision to climb the Abruzzi Ridge. It's the most obvious and probably the most straightforward way up K2. At first, the team made good progress, and on July the 12th, a month after leaving base camp, Camp 3 was established at 23,000 feet. Though the route now became progressively more exposed, the lead climbers made excellent progress. House and Bates now took over the lead, and House overcame the first major obstacle of the Abruzzi Ridge, a 150-foot band of vertical rock. This route has since become known as House's Chimney. The weather broke and food supplies began to run out, but Petzold and Houston reached 26,000 feet, within striking distance of the summit. Sadly, they were now forced by bad weather to retreat, though this first attempt on the Abruzzi remains a remarkable achievement. The year after Charlie Houston made his attempt, another expedition, led by Fritz Weissner, an American of German extraction, led an expedition to K2. 
Feister and the Sherpa, Pasangdawa, established Camp 8 at 25,000 feet on July the 14th, 1939, with Dudley Wolfe in support at Camp 7. They were in striking distance of the summit. Now, something went radically wrong. A young and experienced climber, Durrance, assuming that Weissner would be returning triumphant in a couple of days, systematically stripped the mountain of all the gear in the lower camps, including the spare sleeping bags. This extraordinary decision left the mountain completely bare. And this is where the tragedy was to begin. They dropped down the following day to Camp 7, still expecting to find Sherpas and other climbers. And of course, then they were appalled to find that there was nothing there. The tent was evidently being left open. It was full of snow. There was no supplies, no food, but most important of all, no sleeping bags. And they'd left their sleeping bags back at the camp above them. They had a bitterly cold night. And then the next day, they had to carry on down. Now, Dudley Wolf had actually brought his sleeping bag down with him. He had a sleeping bag. And so he decided he'd just wait up there for them to come back and make yet another bid for the summit. It was the Sherpas who tried to rescue Dudley Wolf. And tragically, in trying to rescue him, three of the Sherpas lost their lives, and they never got Dudley Wolf back. There was, of course, a gap caused by the Second World War, and it wasn't until 1953 that another expedition returned to K2. It was an American trip again, led by Charlie Houston, who led the original 1938 expedition. They once again made an extremely good and detailed film of what was to be another really horrendous story, and one which was to bear an uncanny resemblance to the events of 1986. By now, Dr. Charles Houston was the most experienced American Himalayan climber of his generation. His team in 1953 was to perform incredibly well. After only 40 days on the mountain, they were consolidating their position at Camp 8 at 25,000 feet with ample food supplies. But, cruelly, the weather broke and a series of savage storms pinned them down in their top camp. On the sixth day, tragedy struck. Charlie Houston. We crawled out of our tents and stumbled around camp like castaways. As Art felt he crawled out to join us, he collapsed. During the night, Art had begun to cough, a dry, hacking cough. My fears were confirmed as I listened to his chest. At least two areas of the lung showed that cops had been carried there. He would probably not live through the descent, but we did have to give him every chance we could, and we had to do it soon. We must get him off the mountain. It was the 9th of August. We were the highest men in the world. Painfully, Houston's men began the evacuation of their stricken comrade, in the teeth of the continuing storm. The shattered climbers, by now suffering from exposure, left Art Gilkey in the middle of a slope and traversed across to try and find some shelter to put a tent up, for by now they were desperately in need of food and drink. Sometime later, they returned across the slope to retrieve Art Gilkey. Bob Bates. About 10 minutes after Gilkey's last shout, Strether, Craig and I roped up and began to cross the slope to reach the injured man and move him somehow to the ice ledge where we now had two small tents. Fortunately, the wind had dropped as we reached the rock rib and looked into the gully where Art had been left suspended. What we saw there I shall never forget. The whole slope was bare of life. Art Gilkey was gone. At last in 1954, the mountain was climbed. This time it was a very strong Italian expedition. They made really good fast progress and two Italian climbers, Compagnoni and Lacadelli, actually made the summit bid. They ran out of oxygen when they were just 500 feet below the summit but they managed to struggle on to the top. But in the struggle to get there and then getting back down they both got very severe frostbite and actually had to be carried out. Also tragically another Italian was killed. Mario Puccio's a young guide. For the next 15 years, the whole Karakorum was closed because of political troubles. But in 1975, the area was open and once more expeditions were allowed up the Baltoro Glacier. A huge expedition led by Lou Whitaker and costing $100,000 set off to attempt the northwest ridge of K2.
bridge was the route we were to attempt in 1986, though the Americans chose an unnecessarily hard approach, giving some desperately difficult climbing that we, with a bit of cunning, would manage to avoid. The American Camp 2 was eventually established at 20,400 feet, just four yards inside the Chinese border. Whittaker's expedition seemed set for a successful attempt on the summit, then K2 struck again. The weather broke and Whittaker and his team were marooned in the tents by a series of savage storms which pinned them down for 18 days. Many of the climbers felt that Whittaker, his brother and his wife were interested only in reaching the summit and were treating the other climbers as mere beasts of burden. One of them wrote in his personal diary, if Lou Whittaker resorts to superior physical strength, he should end up with an ice axe in the back of his head. The American dream was falling apart. On July the 3rd, the weather finally cleared. Conflicts and tensions forgotten, Whittaker's expedition returned their attention once more to K2. Their goal, to push the route out above Camp 2. In spite of the enforced delay, if they could open up Camp 3, the American super expedition would still have a chance. sickness and the evacuation of a seriously ill porter foiled them, and the Northwest Ridge remained unclimbed. The most expensive expedition to K2 had failed. After Chris Bonington's successful expedition to the unclimbed southwest face of Everest in 1975, it was inevitable that he'd turn his attentions to K2. In 1978, he mounted a small lightweight expedition to the unclimbed West Ridge. Was it better? He took with him the nucleus of the 1975 expedition, including Doug Scott and Nick Escort. Anyway, what does it all look like? Well, you can just see a glassy going down into the desert. I spent about three seconds looking at the view. Oh, well, you nearly got as high as the American. High as the American. Yeah, yeah. We decided on the southern approach to the West Ridge, and on the 5th of June, Doug Scott Joe Task and Pete Borden actually moved up to Camp 1 to start pushing the route out towards what we hoped to be Camp 2. Camp 1 was around about 19,000 feet above sea level. I stayed just one more day down below to get everything sorted up before going up to join them. And I must say, at this stage, everything seemed really good. The whole team was now gelling together. We were immensely optimistic and really glad to be getting our teeth into it. But even so, I think we all realized just how serious and how big a problem it was. One of the problems was avalanche danger, as Pete Baldwin explains. The fear that we had on K2 was of snow, untrodden snow. You have no history of pattern of avalanches to learn from. And so as soon as we started at the West Ridge, we were looking for the safest looking route. While Pete Baldwin and Joe Tasker pushed the route out above Camp 2, Below in support, Nick Escort and Doug Scott buried loads. Well, I was just looking forward to getting to Camp 2, 30 feet to go. I was having a last rest, gasping away for air. And, and suddenly there was a tremor went through the snow underneath me. And almost straight after, there was another one. And by this time, the adrenaline was surging through my body. And I realized that there was going to be something nasty happening. And I dived onto my eyesight, pressed it into the snow as a kind of belay. And I looked back across my tracks and realized that the whole of the snow slope was sliding off. It's about ooh, 11 o'clock in the morning, I suppose. Jim Duff and I were actually digging out a platform to put another tent up. And suddenly, this huge pile of snow avalanche came pouring down over the ice cliffs.
And I just hadn't thought this was possible. I suppose because I'd chosen the route going across the snow slope about 1,500 feet above, and I thought it was absolutely safe. And I tried to reassure Jim and told him that I thought that this was an avalanche that must have broken away quite a bit below where the line of our route went. The whole slope just began to move. It was absolutely enormous. It was so big that I couldn't believe it. It was like watching a film. And the figure in the middle was just completely overwhelmed by this avalanche. He moved down with the slope. The slope seemed to be moving down with him. Uh, and then he just disappeared. Suddenly I found myself catapulted right out in the stands. Ice axe just ripped out the snow and I was cartwheeling and sliding uncontrollably down the slope towards the avalanche. Suddenly I found myself stopped dead in the snow. I'd gone right over to a complete somersault. With 65 pounds on my back, I made like a giant anchor in the snow. And with that stop, the rope snapped. I rubbed myself down, looked around for Nick. But he got Ice clip, steep, yelling his name. Nothing to do, but just go up to camp two. And then Pete and Joe came down the ropes, and we sat there very tearful. To go and finally got the radio out and radio down. And Chris was on open call, and, and, and we explained what had happened. And Doug, his voice was breaking, is obviously in tears, and said that Nick had been caught in an avalanche and in fact had been in that avalanche that had come pouring down. K2 had claimed its first British victim and Chris Bonington abandoned the expedition. Doug, Pete and Joe returned in 1980. Once more they failed and sadly Peter Boardman and Joe Tasker were killed on Everest in 1982. The West Ridge was finally climbed in 1983 by a really huge Japanese expedition which left just two unclimbed ridges, the Southwest and the Northwest Ridge. And it was the Great Northwest Ridge that we were going on in 1986. On the 23rd of May 1986, the British Fuller's K2 expedition set up base camp at the foot of the Savoy Glacier. Traditionally, all the British expeditions to K2 have camped here and it's become known as the British Base Camp. Some half mile away, the other expeditions gathered on the bleak strip of glacial moraine that forms the main K2 base camp. Legendary names began to arrive. Vonda Rakevich, the first European woman to climb Everest, her Polish friends Wojtek Broz on his third K2 expedition, and Dobroslava Wolf, nicknamed Marufka, also on her third visit to the Karakorum. A large Korean expedition arrived to attempt the Abruzzi, using oxygen and fixed ropes. Their tents and ropes were to prove critical later on. Veteran Kurt Deenberger and Julie Tullis had also arrived to film and climb, as had Alfred Imitzer, who was the leader of a team of Austrian guides, including Hans Wieser and Billy Bauer. At our base camp, Al Rouse was organising his lead climbers into two groups. Al, Phil Burke, Aid Burgess and John Porter formed the A team. The B team was John Barry, Al Burgess, Dave Wilkinson and Brian Hall. These two teams would take turns to push the route out. For Al Rouse, the years of planning and dreaming were about to become reality. K2 is really the mountaineer's mountain. I'd like to climb it far more than Everest. It's probably the hardest mountain in the world to climb by any route. And the route which we're trying is unclimbed, the Northwest Ridge. Now K2's got six ridges in total. Four of them have been climbed now. But two, the Southwest Ridge and the Northwest Ridge, remain unclimbed. Certainly, if anyone on the expedition reaches the top, which I believe they will do, and certainly hope they will do, it'll be very much a team effort on this occasion, because there's a lot of fixed roping, a lot of work, before we can get within striking distance of the summit. Al Burgess. To be climbing the new route on K2, there's a certain sense of adventure and unknown. To be moving up slopes that you know that very few people have ever climbed before is always exciting. Usually, two people climb first in the fixed row to safeguard a descent. And then the group afterwards all help in ferrying equipment up these ropes to establish a camp. The wall below Camp 1 was quite steep, with a lot of fresh snow gathering on it, reasonable amount of avalanche risk, 
but five minutes below Camp 1, there was an area we called the Nutcracker, which was a huge ice tower that formed a passage between the mountain and the big tower itself. And every day it seemed as though the tower was moving. And although it was only a short distance, maybe two or three minutes of movement, we were all very conscious that if it did collapse, you had no chance. We didn't hang around in it. Above Camp 1, a steep 3,000 foot face of ice, snow and rock proved to be harder and far more time consuming than we had expected. It took almost three weeks of effort, often climbing in bad weather, to get Camp 2 established on the crest of the Northwest Ridge proper. Then more time was spent ferrying supplies up the face to enable Al Rouse and John Porter to start preparing the critical upper half of the ridge itself. The vast length of the climb and the frequent storms that often caused the climbers to return to base camp slowly took its toll on enthusiasm and fitness. Sometimes you find yourself trapped on the mountain by bad weather in a storm and you have to spend the night there. And with the snow building up around the tent and avalanches crashing down around you, you know you have to descend in the morning and it's a hard decision to make. But once you've left the tent and you're out there on the fixed rope in the wind, the adrenaline pumping through your body helps. You know you have to get down and the further you get down, the better, the thicker the air and the less the wind blows. The unpredictable arrival of bad weather made for slow progress. Other expeditions had similar problems, and the Americans were the victims of the first tragedy of the summer. One evening, while we were at Camp 1, we heard the news over the radio. There had been a terrible avalanche on the south pillar of K2, and two of the Americans, the leader, John Smollick, and Alan Pennington, had been killed. Kurt and Julie were at base camp, and saw the avalanche sweep 3,000 feet down. For John and Alan, there was absolutely no chance of their survival. Alan's body, in fact, was recovered later and buried at the Gilkey Memorial. Shocked by the disaster, we returned to the mountain, doubly aware of the need for caution. One of the advantages of using fixed rope is that it does enable you moving up and down the mountain to allow your body to adjust to the altitude, to allow your physiology to adapt to the changing conditions and environment. If you don't allow your body to acclimatize, you suffer a severe risk of getting high altitude sickness, either cerebral or pulmonary edema, water on the brain that ultimately will kill you. Once again, the deteriorating weather forced us to return to base camp, only to discover that another epic was being acted out near the summit of K2. A very small French expedition that included Maurice and Lillian Barard and Michel Pimentier had climbed the Abruzzi Ridge. With them was Wanda Rakevich, the well-known Polish climber. She had made the first female ascent of K2, but below the summit, they lingered far too long. The Barards, perhaps overcome with exhaustion, had either fallen or collapsed. Michel Pimentier was stranded above 26,000 feet and Wanda was lost somewhere in the vast regions of the Abruzzi Ridge. As the storm blew in, we worried for the safety of everyone on the mountain. Wanda managed to fight her way back down to safety and Michel, who had risked his life in waiting for the return of the Barards, had had a desperate epic. After two days' uncertainty, they arrived almost simultaneously at base camp. For Wanda, the satisfaction of being the first woman to climb K2 was tempered with the knowledge that Lillian and Maurice, who had shared our triumph, were both dead. On July the 10th, the Polish expedition was plunged into gloom with more bad news. Having completed a new and very bold route on K2, Jerzy Kukushka and Tadeusz Petrovsky had met with disaster. Petrovsky had lost both his crampons and fallen to his death. After almost two months on the mountain, we had reached a high point of 24,500 feet. At this point, beset with storms and finding that each attempt gained progressively less and less real height, 
it was reluctantly decided that everyone was beating their head against a brick wall. And then we suffered a double blow. Brian Hall and John Porter had to go home. John because of his job, and Brian with a serious leg injury. Al Burgess. We decided to pack in the Northwest Ridge because the team wasn't strong enough or large enough for such a, a major objective. But what we did see around the other side of the mountain on the Abruzzi Spur was all kinds of people summiting on K2. But we decided to have a try at that. The Burgess twins, Al Rouse, Dave Wilkinson, John Barry and Phil Burke, set off to make a quick alpine-style ascent of the Abruzzi, hoping to reach the summit in just three or four days. A successful ascent would, perhaps, make up for the disappointment of our protracted failure on the Northwest Ridge. But, as Al Burgess explains, it was not to be. One o'clock in the afternoon, clouds started to blow in from the west, and it was obvious the weather was on the change. With alpine-style climbing, you have to make fast decisions. If you're not climbing up, you don't have the food to sit and wait. You have to go down. And that's exactly what we did. Four hours later, at our high point, we were sat back drinking tea in base camp. Everyone on the mountain retreated, but the lone Italian, Renato Casarotto, never arrived. It's the morning of the 17th of July, and there's been some really dreadful news. We heard last night that Renato Casarotto had had a crevasse fall on his way down from the southwest ridge and had radioed his wife, Beretta, asking for help. We were woken up in the middle of the night and rushed up about two hours above uh, base camp onto the glacier where we found a, a rather sad group of people round uh, Casarotto. He'd fallen about 120 foot into a crevasse and Kurt Deanberger, amongst others, had managed to pull him out but he'd obviously sustained massive internal injuries and by the time we arrived, Casarotto was dead. After all these setbacks, the rest of the team had decided to give it until the end of July to make one further attempt on the Abruzzi, but now our time was up. Everyone had work commitments and we'd been here for over two months. Only Al Rouse was prepared to stay on for one last attempt and I decided to stay and wait as well. For Al, the prospect of returning home without climbing K2 was unthinkable, but he'd run out of partners. So he teamed up with the Polish climber, Marufka Wolf. Marufka had decided not to go on the southwest ridge with the rest of the Polish team, fearing that the route was beyond her capabilities, but she was well able to attempt the Abruzzi ridge, and so the two teamed up. On my own at base camp, I could relay radio messages to the teams now converging on the Abruzzi ridge. Apart from the six poles on the south-southwest ridge, three Koreans had already started, followed by the Austrians Alfred Imitzer, Hans Wieser and Billy Barr. Kurt Deenberger and Julie Tullis were also preparing for one final effort, and so with Alan Marufka there were now 16 climbers involved in what was to be the last attempt of the summer. I need climbing now as part of my life. I need that stimulus, that excitement. and the natural beauty of the mountains. Every time I've been away on an expedition, whether successful or occasionally failure, when I get back to England, I feel completely rejuvenated, batteries recharged, ready for anything. So great to just go in, turn the tap on and have water instead of waiting for hours to melt the snow. All these little luxuries that we take for granted in normal life all become suddenly very real and life itself takes on a new meaning until after six months or a year you need another recharge and you have to go away again. If I don't climb, life seems empty. I suppose the problem is in the end, it's addictive. And for some people it's a fatal addiction. During the next interminable days, I recorded the harrowing story in the form of a diary. Today is Friday the 1st of August and it is a most beautiful and stunningly clear day. There's a slight breeze, but the whole of K2 is in the sunshine. Uh, the next two days will be absolutely critical. Uh, I was intending to get to the top tomorrow. Uh, he can um, be a day late, perhaps. Uh, I suppose if he's going incredibly well, he could be a day early. But once above 8,000 metres, 
and your lifespan is dramatically shortened. Uh, if the accumulation of snow at the top of the Abruzzi hasn't become too deep, and I can make steady progress, uh, the next couple of days might well see the first British ascent of K2, the second highest mountain in the world. Today is Saturday the 2nd of August and should be the day that Al and Marushka get to the summit. Quite frankly I'm grip rigid sitting down here on my own at base camp. Uh, it's a perfect summit day if Al is on schedule. But the situation at base camp is incredibly tense. The Koreans are trying an oxygen based attempt on the summit tomorrow. Um, I've got no news of Kurt and Julie who are trying again on their second really major attempt. So it really is a question of wait and see and hope and pray that everyone, whatever nationality, uh, it would just be great if they all go up this bloody mountain and then we could all go home. Hello Wojtek, hello Wojtek, do you read me? This is Jim at base camp. Do you read me? Over. I read you loud and clear. If you have any contact with o the summit team, over. No, I can get no response, but I've only just started. Any news from you? Over. Well, we had contact. Uh, yesterday at 8 it's the evening of August the 2nd, and I've just made contact with Christina of the Polish B team. They're at Kazarotto's last bivouac, and above them, Wojtek is poised for the summit. But the big news, as far as I'm concerned, is that I've heard that Al Rouse and Marufka have reached Camp 4, along with Kurt Deenberger and Julie Tullis. Also at Camp 4, the three Austrians and the Korean team. So with a bit of luck, they should all top out tomorrow. It's really tense at base camp at the moment, and the next 24 hours should be good. Today is Sunday the 3rd of August, and as far as the Dollars British K2 expedition is concerned, today is D-Day. Al apparently spent the night camped next to the Korean tent at 7,900 metres climb today. The tension is absolutely unbearable. Uh, at 10 o'clock the weather is certainly not good. Uh, the summit of K2 appears and disappears and it's much windier than it was yesterday. It's half past 12, uh, it's long the third and still no news but clouds are now beginning to well up all around big puffs of cloud are drifting past, uh, the wind's obviously getting up up there, and Broadbeak has got a cloud cup, so the weather's definitely on the turn. Two o'clock, I just made contact with Janusz on uh, the bivouac, and he says the weather up there is very bad. This also means, of course, the Abruzzi will be in very, very bad weather, so my worst fears are in fact being realised. There's no news at all about all the Koreans, all the Austrians, but I'll go down and check that out. Well, in case you haven't realised, the uh, Korean expedition reached the summit of K2. So, congratulations all around. They look incredibly happy and pleased with themselves, as well they might. Uh, moved the Koreans into the world stage of mountaineering. And, oh, thank you very much. I've just been given a sweet by the Korean bears and officer. Oh, given lots of sweets by the Korean bears and officer. <laughs> thank you. This morning is the morning of Monday, August the 4th and I was woken at 7 o'clock by the Austrian captain, the liaison officer, who said he had some bad news. The three Polish climbers <coughs> who made the summit very late last night descended to Camp 4, and we think on the way to Camp 4, one of them died. 
but yet another rumour has now transpired that Al, Kurt and Julie have gone for the summit today. And this again is worrying because clouds are now beginning to drift across the top of the Abruzzi and more, much more worrying is a high scum of feathery cloud is coming up from the south where the bad weather always comes from. And now, it's now nearly 10 o'clock. The sky is now getting greyer and greyer by the moment. And apparently, not only are the Austrians, Kurt, Julie, Al, uh, etc., going to the top, but also three more Austrians who've already been at 8,000 metres for four nights, if that can be believed. Um, it seems like everyone up there uh, has got summit fever and is going for it despite the knowledge that the Barards and everyone else who's been near the summit of K2 has spent too long there and met with disaster. People just shouldn't spend so much time above 8,000 metres. Really, you've got to go there, get to the top next day and get back down. And that's something our expedition understood very clearly, or it seemed to. Yet Owl now seems to be doing precisely the opposite. You just don't get fitter or stronger resting at 8,000 metres. Thankfully, the Polish B team seem to be on their way down now, Janusz, Christina and Anna. The ones Jeff just left with a feeling of terrible fatness and, and anticlimax. Well, it's nearly time for the radio call. It's about 10 to 6. But the Koreans have just told me that they think it's Wojtek who's been killed. So the radio call will merely, merely confirm that. The other news is that uh, Baltic Gordon on the Korean expedition has just been killed by a falling stone between advanced base and camp one. And so it goes on. Hey, going down. It's Korean. From summit. Wojtek and one Korean. Going four down from this detailed bed section without... Well, it's summary time on Monday the 4th. Alan, Maruka are now on the mountain on their sixth day. Kurt and Julie are on the mountain for the seventh. I honestly don't know where the three Austrians, how long they've been there, but what I do know is that the three Austrians have spent four nights above 8,000 meters. And my doubts and worries over the next couple of days, the fate of the, the seven up there are just enormous. Um, it just doesn't seem to be anything else to say.
should see it through, but I'm now fairly convinced in my own mind that Al, Julie, Kurt, Marufka, and the three Austrians are probably all dead. It's the 10th of August today. I've just returned from a cold, windy, and very lonely night at advanced base and have reluctantly accepted that there has been a dreadful disaster somewhere near the summit of K2. So now they've been gone for 12 days, which is exactly double Al's estimated time. And I think Really, there's all hope is gone for Alan, Marufka, Kurt and Julie, and the three Austrians. This brings a total of deaths on K2 now to 15. And it clearly isn't worth it. More people have died than have reached the summit. It's, it's sad, futile, tragic. And uh, I just can't wait to get away from this place now. It's Wednesday the 13th of August, and since the last report, a lot's happened. As dusk fell on the 11th, there was a sudden commotion outside the base camp tent, and we looked out see a sight of a figure stumbling and swaying as he approached base camp. We all rushed out and met him and it was Billy Bauer, the Austrian climber, uh, absolutely on his last legs, dried blood around his face, unable to speak. We got him back into the tents and finally a disjointed story emerged. Kurt Deenberger was somewhere behind him. Uh, Julie Tullis was dead uh, at camp four. Al had been left there, unable to, to move. Uh, Imitzer and Weiser had collapsed soon after they started coming down, and Marufka as well was missing. Well, uh, Janusz, Christina and myself went up to advanced base, got there at about half eleven, and uh, I set off up onto the first long snow slope onto the Abruzzi, and in the dark, almost bumped into to Kurt, descending painfully slowly, and he turned to me and said, I've lost Julie. Uh, well, we spent most of, of yesterday getting him down back to base camp, uh, and slowly the story of how they were trapped in the storm at Camp 4 emerged. Well, he came round amazingly quickly. He was very lucid, and he explained that he'd left Camp 4 the day before in the teeth of the storm, having sat it out for six days, during which time Julie had died two of the Austrians, one had gone completely uh, off his head and the other was on the verge of death and by the time he left Al was delirious, obsessed with water and Kurt said that he didn't think Al would last the night and he tried desperately to put it to Al to come down but Al was sort of lapsing in and out of uh, dreams, nightmares, sleep and was incapable of doing anything. But what didn't emerge until right at the end was uh, the fact that, that Al in fact had climbed K2. He got to the summit on the 4th of August, uh, followed a couple of hours later by Kurt and Julie. So although the, the carnage and the toll is dreadful, uh, five more deaths on this awful summer, 13 deaths in all, uh, Al did in fact achieve his ambition. He did make the first British descent of K2, followed, as I say, by Julie Tullis. And that's really all there is to say. <laughs>